The emperor of Japan between 1912 and 1926 was Yoshihito, uh, the son of the Meiji emperor, if you're familiar with Japanese history and the Meiji era. Uh, he was the father of the Showa emperor, alias Hirohito. The uh, era in which he was, uh, was reigning is known as the Taisho era, so therefore he is referred to as the Taisho emperor. So the Taisho period is 1912 to 1926. This period saw um, some major changes in Japan. They saw, in, in large part because, whereas the Meiji emperor was very, uh, very active uh, and uh, his government was very reliant upon the oligarchy uh, of elder statesmen that that emperor uh, relied on. The, the new Taisho emperor had a lot of health problems and he wasn't as actively involved. And things shifted. Uh, power shifted toward the Japanese parliament known as the Diet, which has nothing to do with food that had been established under Meiji. And uh, during this period, the uh, World War I uh, and its aftermath through the 1920s uh, is known as the Taisho democracy because there was a big shift toward a more liberal, constitutional, republican way of, of, of governing. So there were a lot of... Uh, a lot of freedoms um, introduced that uh, had not been the norm before, uh, and there was kind of a kind of a time of, well, really uh, sort of liberal ideas being being promoted. But it was also a time when uh, there was a lot of uh, governmental unrest because the military. Uh, and the military, particularly the military leadership, wasn't real keen on this kind of civilian leadership, particularly the direction that things were going in. And uh, that uh, political unrest would lead to political violence later in the 1920s. While all this was going on, Japan, just like Germany, and just like uh, the United States and, and Europe, was undergoing a red scare as a result of the, uh, the successful communist revolution in Russia that led to the establishment of the Soviet Union. So that was a factor in Germany at this time as the uh, power of the left and popularity of the left was growing and that was really freaking out some of the more conservative elements in Germany. Same thing's happening in Japan. The uh, Communist Party of Japan started uh, being really uh, active. Actually, the party itself was, was banned, but individuals uh, still su subscribed to that philosophy. And because of all these newly instituted freedoms, they were able to get elected and wind up in the diet, which also uh, can you know, further sort of ticked off uh, both the military leadership and the more conservative elements of Japanese society. So there's a little bit of hysteria about a potential communist takeover. And the military really started uh, exerting more and more influence. There were several political assassinations that sort of rocked the country. There was a, uh, well, a police force, the Kempe Tai, that uh, is very similar to the uh, Nazi Gestapo that really uh, was suppressing quite a bit of, of activity among Japanese citizens in the uh, late 20s and throughout the 1930s and into the 1940s. While this was all going on, the military leadership was also sort of flexing their muscles, um, wanting their military to be able to expand uh, and have the resources to expand and this, uh, this was demonstrated in 1931 in Manchuria, which is in northeastern China. There's a railroad there that the Japanese controlled. They had taken it away from the Russians in that Russo-Japanese war. And so they had soldiers there guarding the railroad. 
there was an explosion at the railroad. It was a small amount of dynamite, not even enough to damage the track because a train passed by not long afterwards. It was later discovered that the Japanese themselves had set off the explosion, but they blamed it on Chinese dissidents and used that as an excuse to invade Manchuria and take it away from China. And they set it up as a puppet government, renamed it Manchukuo, and they got the former Chinese emperor, Puyi, who was the last emperor, the last Qing dynasty Manchurian emperor, who had uh, abdicated the throne. He'd been emperor as a child. And uh, around the time of World War I, China had become a republic and uh, there was no more Chinese empire. So this guy had, had grown up, was living kind of a uh, um, playboy lifestyle. And uh, the, the Japanese installed him as the puppet emperor of Manchukuo. Um, in fact, there was, a, there was a movie called The Last Emperor about that, probably 25 years ago. So that happened, uh, which led to a lot of tension between the Chinese, obviously, and the Japanese. And when it was discovered, the Japanese had essentially faked all this. Uh, that led to a, a series of... Uh, um, disputes in the League of Nations and led to Japan leaving the League of Nations. A few years later, uh, in a, at a, near a bridge in China, the Marco Polo Bridge, which is the European name for it, it was a bridge that Marco Polo had described in his travels. Well, there were Japanese soldiers uh, who were on maneuvers and kind of a long story, but there had been a war called the Boxer Rebellion back in the early 1900s. And as a result uh, of that, the treaty ending that, uh, China was uh, had allowed the armies of the various allied nations to have limited maneuvers inside their country. Except Japan had way, way more soldiers than, than was normal, um, a large number, which made the Chinese very nervous. So Chinese sent troops uh, to the area where the uh, Japanese maneuvering was going on. And there was an incident, uh, a Chinese, I'm sorry, a Japanese soldier um, was AWOL, absent without leave. He was missing. And the Japanese claimed that the Chinese soldiers had abducted him and demanded that they be allowed to come into the Chinese uh, area, the Chinese cities, and search for him. Uh, the Chinese refused. Uh, turns out the guy had got lost in the woods looking for a place to go to the bathroom, and later he showed up. Uh, but with all this raised tension around this bridge, somebody started shooting, and we still don't know who fired first or what the circumstances were. Just somebody started shooting, and they were shooting at one another before long. And bang, China and Japan are once more at war. Uh, previous time had probably been about 40 years before this. So a war between China and Japan. This was in July. 1937. A little, well, two years uh, and almost two months before the German invasion of Poland. So this is an alternative and I think probably a, a more correct uh, point to say that World War II had started because the major combatants were, uh, well, they, they were engaged in, in combat uh, beginning right, right then. So that war would be a very long destructive war. Uh, the rest of the world sided with, uh, for the most part, not the uh, Axis powers, Germany and Italy, uh, but the allies, including the U.S., tended to side and be sympathetic to China, but no one actually did much. They were like, ah, you shouldn't do that. The Japanese army fought its way toward the city of Nanjing, then spelled and pronounced Nanking, which at that time was serving as the capital of China. Uh, the Japanese soldiers had been told that it was going to be an, an easy victory and an easy march and they would go straight to the capital. But in reality, what happened was that there was a lot of resistance from the uh, Chinese military. So it took them longer than they expected and it was much more hard fought and the Japanese had much higher casualties than they had anticipated by the time they finally reached Nanjing in December. Uh, remember, the war started in July 
This is 1937. So some people have, some historians have speculated that maybe that was a factor. The, uh, the frustration, uh, perhaps anger at the unexpected casualties, or just the, the, the bestial fog of war. Whatever, whatever the reason, when the Japanese did capture the city, it was absolutely horrible. Uh, the incident was reported at the time uh, around the world and referred to as the Rape of Nanking, meaning, you know, metaphorically of the city, but also, also literally. Uh, the Japanese Imperial Army came in and estimates vary, uh, but uh, some have the number as high as 300,000 people who were killed, and that's not just military. In fact, most of it was not military. They just sort of uh, went went into a, uh, a killing frenzy that lasted for days and days and days. Uh, 300,000 people, if it were that many, some say 100, 200. Uh, there were maybe four or 500,000 people living in and around the city. Uh, so that gives you an idea just uh, how, you know, the, the percentage, at least, of the area that was horribly affected. And in addition, addition to that, um, like I said, literal, literal rape. Uh, and it, it wasn't, um, well, it was systematic. Uh, groups of soldiers were traveling house to house and uh, taking all the, the females and, and raping them uh, anywhere from 20,000 women, including uh, young girls and, and old women, uh, to perhaps as many as 80,000, most of whom were killed also. Um, you can see on the right there some uh, uh, photographs of Japanese soldiers executing civilians and uh, Chinese soldiers. On the lower left, this is uh, a report from a Japanese newspaper. A couple of newspapers were following this, uh, well, this friendly bet that uh, two Japanese army officers had who could cut off the most Chinese people's heads, who could get to a hundred first. And the paper was kind of following them. They were checking in every day or two, see how many uh, they had so far, uh, almost like it was the sports pages. Uh, this, uh, well, it was, it was the end of the war before the full details were, were released uh, around the world to the general public, but just the things that were trickling out as it, as it was happening and immediately afterward were enough to shock people all around, all around the globe. These two, uh, these two guys in the uh, uh, decapitating contest were tried for war crimes at the end of the war and executed by firing squad. Now, while this is going on, there were some Europeans living in the city uh, particularly in um, embassies, you know, from, from, from different countries. And because uh, an embassy is technically the, uh, you know, it is the property of the country that owns it, even though it's in another country. So this was a place that some, uh, some Chinese civilians were able to be invited in and, and sheltered and essentially had amnesty and protection. Um, among the countries that were doing this uh, at their embassies was Germany. And it was actually a um, German diplomat, uh, John Robb, who was uh, uh, very active in trying to save civilians. And he was uh, outraged and shocked. So just to give you an idea of the, the level of, of um, viciousness, it was shocking the Nazis, uh, which obviously takes some doing. Well, Again, just like the incident at the Marco Polo Bridge, the world's response was, um, yeah, don't be doing that stuff. Uh, but it didn't result in any European countries interceding militarily uh, in any way. Uh, not at that time. Uh, not until European, uh, initially European colonies uh, started to be affected. The Japanese were able to control much of eastern China and several places down along the, uh, the coast, but uh, got no further uh, into, the, uh, 
into central China and into the West because the uh, Chinese military was, was resisting them and later they had help. Um, but they already had Manchuria. They had actually annexed Korea back in 1910. And starting in 1939, started uh, conscripting Koreans into service for manual labor um, and conscripted uh, many Korean women to be, quote, comfort women, uh, prostitutes for Japanese soldiers against their will. Uh, they kept expanding. Uh, over the next couple of years, they uh, uh, eventually, by 1942, uh, summer of 1942, at the height of the Japanese Empire, and this is after uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, you can see the map there, they had, uh, they had control of Southeast Asia and many of the islands uh, there in the Pacific. And their justification for doing this was the creation of what they called, quote, the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, end quote, uh, which is uh, obviously a very euphemistic description of what they were doing. But, you know, on paper, hey, co-prosperity, that sounds great. Who wouldn't want that? In essence, uh, the, uh, the Japanese were, um, well, they were critical of all the colonial imperialistic ventures of European countries in Asia, and justifiably so. They should have been critical of that. Uh, essentially, they said, we are, going to, uh, we are going to protect Asia from European colonization and imperialism uh, because we're going to do it, uh, essentially. It's okay if we do it because we also are Asian. In 1936... Germany and Italy had formed an alliance that Mussolini uh, initially was the first person to call it this. It was the Axis. Uh, so they're known as the Axis powers. You know what an Axis is. Um, the reason they, they used this term was that Germany and Italy were going to be the Axis on which the world was going to turn. Then later, Japan got allowed into the club uh, that is Hideki Tojo in the picture there, the military commander, and it's the military that was in charge in Japan, not the uh, civilian government really anymore. Uh, so Japan became part of the Axis uh, powers, which required a little bit of a stretch for the, uh, uh, the, the Nazis to do that because, right, everyone who is not Aryan, uh, which is to say uh, European, um, particularly Germanic European, they believed was incredibly inferior. Uh, so um, they had to do a little bit of, of, of juggling to, to justify this uh, alliance with, with Japan. But that's where we were as of 1940. So now let's go back uh, and check in with the United States, who is trying really hard to avoid being involved in all that stuff and see what, uh, what we were up to at that time. 